Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's 3.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in the USA, and today we have got a panel of rheumatologists who are going to be taking live questions and providing information around the coronavirus and its relationship and implications with autoimmune conditions, in particular inflammatory arthritic conditions. So I hope everyone's pumped up and ready to go. Uh, I'm over in Florida. Uh, we've got one guest I'll introduce in a minute. She's over on the, uh, on the West Coast in, in California area, and we've got two on the East Coast. And we'll meet our special guest in just a minute. But before we even do that, I want to start getting people posting some questions. Um, and I'll tell you how to do that before I go into our introduction so that we're loaded and ready to go with questions once we uh, start, uh, start our content. Uh, you'll see on the navigation on the right-hand side, whether you're on a smartphone or laptop, uh, there is a string of icons from the top down. It says settings, attendees, and then chat. I want you to click on chat and you can say hi, tell us where you're from, uh, or even uh, uh, a question to, uh, to the guests. So that's how this is going to work. Um, today's event, although we have specialist medical doctors, uh, is not specific medical advice for individuals. Today's event is to provide general guidelines um, based on the information available in the published literature and their, and, uh, and, and general uh, best practices for these um, special times that we're in, but certainly speak to your individual uh, primary care physician or rheumatologist to gain the specifics about your condition before making any changes, especially to your medications. Okay, so let's meet our very special guests today. We have three. First of all, a good friend of mine who I have respected and regarded for many years is Dr. Nisha Manik. She's a rheumatologist and pioneer in integrative medicine for the treatment of inflammatory diseases. She is also an alumnus of Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Hello, how are you? Hey, good to see you, Clint, and really good to be on your program today. Thanks for jumping in for this very important webinar. And I also want to say thanks to my friends, Dr. Jose Pando and George Munoz. I know you're introducing them, but glad to be here. Yes, and they wouldn't be here except for you. So I'm very grateful at you co-organizing this for me and bringing in the A-team. Our A-team uh, consists of Jose A. Pando, MD. He's a board certified rheumatologist at Delaware Arthritis. Uh, uh, in Lewis, Let me, I'll have him correct me there, but certainly in Delaware. Um, he is, uh, he takes a holistic approach to care, taking into consideration his patients' overall health, not just their symptoms or disease. Thank you, Dr. Pando. Thank you, Clint. I'm glad to be here and thank you, Tanisha, as well. Absolutely. And finally, uh, Dr. Munoz is a board certified rheumatologist. He completed a postdoc fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. George personally possesses a wide skill of training, including traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, homeopathy, energy medicine, and martial arts discipline. He is a national speaker on topics including nutrition, arthritis, and inflammation. So thank you, Dr. Munoz, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Clint. And I have my friends and colleagues, dear friends and colleagues. Nisha, thanks for getting us all rounded together. You're a great organizer. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Clint. <laughs> yes, well, we're all very happy to be here and we're all very grateful for the huge number of people who've joined us today. We're well over 400 guests uh, on this webinar and the questions are coming through thick and fast. Now, in anticipation for this, I have fielded a lot of inquiries about, oh. about this uh, event. And the primary one, of course, concerns medications because of the risk of the coronavirus and whether or not they are counterproductive for prevention of getting this disease. So we're going to get into the medication specifically. And for everyone who's posting questions about their specific medications, we're going to drill down on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, we're going to look at the steroids. We're going to look at the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs and biologic drugs. We're going to get into specifics on the guidelines around each one of these. So just sit back and we will get to those in just a moment. And just before, though, my first question to the panel, based on some of the pre-questions that we have, uh, if you have an autoimmune condition, such as an inflammatory arthritic condition, 
are you therefore inherently more likely to get the coronavirus? May I speak to this? Um, if, if I may j uh, just give a perspective from the data that came out yes, of sir. Wuhan, China. And this is very interesting. Um, this was published in the Lancet Journal on uh, March 9. So it's about three weeks ago. And what these Chinese physicians noted uh, was that when people with serious COVID-19 were being admitted to the hospitals, they made a very interesting observation. And it was this, patients with systemic lupus were not among the people being admitted. So right away, this was a very curious clinical observations. The people that were being admitted to the Wuhan hospitals were people older age, over the age of 65, people with heart disease, high blood pressure and diabetes. Well, why don't people with lupus get serious COVID-19? That doesn't mean they don't get infected, but the more serious infections were the other folks. And that's where they started to ask a very important question. Is it because people with lupus take hydroxychloroquine? This is a very, very well-known medicine in the rheumatology tool bag. It's been known for over 50 years or more. So we have good understanding in terms of clinical usage. And it's the anti-malarial medication that has really got the FDA's attention. So already we had some clinical clues from Wuhan that people with lupus who take hydroxychloroquine may have a milder disease or certainly are not ending up on respirators. Now, this also harks back to SARS-2, the original SARS or coronavirus infection in 2002 and 2003. It was known at that time that antimalarials may have some protective effects in vitro, okay? This is test tube data that shows some protective effects. That means it seems to have antiviral effects. Viruses don't replicate as fast in the presence of uh, hydroxychloroquine. So now we come to this current pandemic. What does this mean? Well, there's been some clinical experience in France, Marseille. They used Plaquenil with an antibiotic in people who are very sick with COVID-19. And the French experience shows that if you treat people in hospitals and ICU with Plaquenil, then they seem to clear the virus faster, okay? Statistically faster. Now, if you add azithromycin to that, they clear it even faster still. Why that should be, we don't know yet. Okay, so there's some unknowns here. Then we come to the USA experience. There's a, there's a physician group in Kansas City, okay? And they've really written some very nice op-eds in the Wall Street Journal, and they're using Plaquenil and azithromycin in combination in their hospitals in Kansas City. And what they're seeing, again, it's not published, but they're putting it out there is that it seems to work. That is, the sicker people seem to clear the virus faster. And so the FDA has fast-tracked Plaquenil into approval. What that means is the sickest people in our ICUs can, uh, their, their doctors have to decide, but they can use Plaquenil for about five days to help clear the virus faster in the sickest people. I hope that helps you give a little perspective into where the Plaquenil has entered into the mainstream armamentarium to, to deal with the pandemic. So I think that's sort of positive news. But, but I just wanna say something about this in terms of rheumatology. And that is, does Plaquenil mean you can use it to prevent virus infections? No, that doesn't mean that. It means a treatment. So our public health guidelines are still firmly in place. 
if you are a rheumatology patient and for whatever reason taking Plaquenil for lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, take it, okay? But we're running into a problem of shortages. And I think that is, uh, uh, that is going to come. And I think efforts are being redirected, the supplies are being redirected to places that really need them. In fact, this morning I actually filled a prescription for Plaquenil and we're being told that it is only being, you know, it, it's really for people now with urgent needs. So I think when, if you're a patient with a rheumatic disease who has a supply, continue taking it. It doesn't prevent the infection. You still have to do all of those wonderful uh, public health uh, guidelines in place, which is hand washing, social distancing, really practicing good personal hygiene and so forth. And then we'll go, you know, hopefully get into some of the integrative practices that we three are very, very good at. We, we do this all the time in terms of education and integrative uh, medicine, but I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. So we've, so that's a great review on Plaquenil and that was uh, to be discussed uh, later on. So we've definitely uh, checked that one off and we've had some questions coming up around that. So uh, thank you. Um, and I just want to ask Dr. Munoz his thoughts before we move past this question. I just want to, do, do people, should people with autoimmune diseases just in general feel more concerned about this condition, about this uh, pandemic? So I think the common sense answer is yes, but we don't have data to support mm. that common sense yeah. fear, feeling, prevalent thought. And it's interesting what uh, uh, Dr. Manick just said about the initial observations out of Wuhan regarding uh, lupus patients. Yeah. I will, I will add that um, we have a cohort right now of about 150 infusion patients in the practice. And um, uh, we've had two lupus patients in the past week who did get ill. And I, I just wanna say that they were stable. They were not flaring. The, uh, one was on a biologic um, and was completely asymptomatic and had two uh, young adult children. And I'm saying that for, for the obvious reason in terms of uh, the issues with social distancing and, um, you know, that it, it isn't always the individual, the patient, but perhaps the, uh, those around them. Uh, nonetheless, she was asymptomatic, stable, and really in 24 hours um, was admitted with double pneumonia and was intubated within 48 hours. She's doing well now. Um, now, she was on Plaquenil. So I bring that up that, you know, the generalities or the initial observations, we have to wait and see. We don't know um, if that's going to bear out as a real preventative. I think that the um, public health uh, uh, recommendations are number one. Uh, the other patient was not on a biologic. She had stable lupus, was on Imuran, and uh, not on steroids. And she too uh, was admitted with a much attenuated, milder case that we actually found by accident. She, she had an atypical presentation that had nothing to do with truly respiratory symptoms. And um, we found a pneumonia on a CAT scan looking at her belly. Oh. And um, yeah. so then the patient got uh, uh, very anxious. Uh, we directed her to the ER. Uh, she was tested, admitted, stable, and then uh, put on azithromycin and, and being discharged, doing well. So. Just like non-immunologic patients, we have asymptomatic, milder cases in all the population. I believe that's how it's going to bear out. Okay, that's well. I mean, it's obviously not not good news to hear about those two patients of yours, but it is uh, refreshing to hear that they've done, um, you know, at least as well as what the common response is for others who have not got autoimmune diseases. Um, Dr. Pandos, um, do you have any patients you'd be able to report who have uh, 
contracted COVID-19 and how they may have done? Fortunately not. We have been very lucky in our state. I live in Delaware. Mm -hmm. Our governor Im implemented uh, uh, isolation or recommended isolation early on and we have reinforced that with our patients as much as possible that is staying home. So far, and we have a large population of inflammatory patients, they have all been healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're very pleased with that. Um, yeah. Following up, and I know that you're going to maybe come in uh, to this point later, something that we are advising family members of patients that usually call us is not to take plaquenil prophylactically, going back to the plaquenil issue. If you are a patient, you continue taking it. If you are not infected or you're not in the hospital, you should not start this medication. Um, that's something that probably will come up later, but since we are addressing plaquenil now, I just wanted to mention that. It's a really good point. And uh, Dr. Manik and I were having a chat about other matters uh, on a separate private call another earlier uh, this week. And she also said that is that she was getting uh, questions from family members saying, hey, I want some of your Plaquenil uh, when the family member did not have any um, other health conditions, just wanted to use it preventatively against COVID-19. And what you've just said is that is not a recommendation. We shouldn't be doing that uh, we should leave that only to those who have been prescribed by their rheumatologist to take this drug and otherwise leave it alone, correct? That's correct. Because what, what we're beginning to see is uh, a shortage of the medication. Patients go to a pharmacy and have been taking this medication for years and now it's not available. Or they're receiving 15-day supplies at a time, mm. which is not optimal, but that's mm. what they're doing, right? Okay. I'll stay with you, Dr. Pando. Would you uh, tell us uh, what's the general guidelines at the moment sh with regards to um, your patients seeing you? Uh, in your practice, do you only do telemedicine at the moment? And do you believe that that is the way that our audience should also be communicating with their rheumatologist? So we are doing telemedicine and we uh, invite patients to come if they have an acute problem that needs an injection, let's say, some, uh, if they have a, let's make, uh, if they have a problem with the knee and they cannot walk, they need an aspiration, they will come and we'll do the procedure. But if it's a, a follow-up, a routine, or they have questions, we'd rather do it like we're doing now through the yeah. computer. It's safer for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you. Now, just for our audience, where we're gonna go from here is we're now gonna drill down on each of the medications. We've got, an enormous number of questions have come through and what I'm hoping to do and the questions keep coming and that and we will get to questions but what I'm hoping to do is to cover off um, as many of the answers to those questions as possible by drilling down on each of the medications now one at a time and I hope that we touch upon the medication that you're on um, during this sequence that we go through and that may cover the answer to your questions um, in that in that sequence and then we're going to look at virus avoidance strategies. As you heard in the bio, uh, biographies that I read out of each of our special panelists today, each have a great knowledge outside of just the uh, conventional um, medical approach that they practice, but also have these other strategies that can complement ways to improve your ability to be virus resistant. So we'll get to those shortly. Uh, let's drill down these medications. Um, uh, who would like to talk about the steroids? So, well, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Host, go ahead. Uh, Dr. So, Pando. In general, um, patients that need the medications are the ones that are prescribed steroids. If you are taking steroids and hopefully you're taking the lower dose that you can, you should be, uh, you should not stop them. You should continue taking whatever medication you need to maintain yourself stable from a immunological point of view. I don't think that a low dose of steroids, most people in our practices will be taking a low dose, will be at a higher risk of, uh, of developing coronavirus. And if they develop it, that they will decompensate any faster. Right. Okay. So, so I think it's, uh, if I may also echo Jose, when we use something like prednisone, it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory. 
And at a certain dose, it becomes immunosuppressive. And I think that's the balance we're always looking at. And generally speaking, um, doses of 10 milligrams of prednisone and higher it would be considered immunosuppressive. And in fact, for certain conditions such as polymyalgia rheumatica or rheumatoid arthritis, where we do give prednisone initially for very uh, fulminant arthritis, you know, sometimes we actually give a, a back, um, an antibacterial called Bactrim to reduce the, the likelihood of them getting infected while they're taking prednisone. That doesn't mean everybody should be doing this, but in selected cases, especially older people who are on steroids, above the uh, dose range of above 10, you are reaching into immunosuppression. Below 10, I think then you see the more anti-inflammatory effects. And certainly below seven and five and so on, I think they're pretty much okay. And I don't think their risk is higher to get co co you know, COVID-19 than the, the normal person, okay? So again, I would say to uh, echo Jose, if you're on a low dose of a prednisone, keep taking it. And if you're really worried, talk to your rheumatologist to try and see, what condition you have, and how do you stepwise, very cautiously reduce your dose under 10? That's a sensible way to, you know, approach the question. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so what we're hearing there, for those who, who uh, didn't quite uh, get the summary, the summary is that high doses of prednisone is not necessarily a good idea. And I think if I can get some nods from my panelists, it's not a real good idea to do high dose of prednisone for long periods of time in any case, in, right? So we want to not really be doing that regardless. Um, but we want to not, in, especially not be taking more, too much more than 10 milligram uh, if we are trying to, you know, minimize our risks of, of, this, uh, of this virus. Um, so let's move from uh, the steroids across to ibuprofen. There's some data that I've seen just in the news around ibuprofen and it's um, recommendations not to take this. Um, someone asked the question, I just saw uh, they're taking a leave and I've never taken a leave, but I wanna know, uh, confirm if that's uh, ibuprofen or not. Uh, so perhaps uh, Dr. Munoz, would you like to field this question? Yes, uh, as I press my little speak button. <laughs> okay, uh, having fun with the controls here on the side. Okay, that's the child in me. Um, so, um, yes, early out of Wuhan and perhaps, uh, perhaps in, uh, out of um, uh, the European experience, we started to hear um, uh, grumblings about uh, uh, OTC anti-inflammatories specifically, Aleve Advil. So to make a long story short, we have no data confirming this. This has not been confirmed. Ergo, um, if you are a patient taking an anti-inflammatory, we don't have any specific reason that due to COVID specifically, this is a problem in spite of the early reporting. So, oh, and I, I, one thing for all of us, I believe is true as we're doing these, I know for you, Clint, too, anything we say is our experience, our opinion, uh, evidence-based as best we can, always consult your doctor, your doctor, your rheumatologist who's treating you. So uh, I'm currently telling my patients uh, not to worry about that specific aspect of medication in this regard. Okay. Um, and with regards to any of the other non-steroidals, there's nothing that's a, there's really a red flag uh, if we head off into the other brands and other types? Correct. Um, th but I will, I'll add this caveat that um, perhaps we as rheumatologists are a little more cognizant of than the general uh, population in terms of physicians and communities. Not that I'm putting them down, it's just that we're dealing with inflammatory patients, we deal with patients of all ages, but we have patients, many patients, over the age of 60 or 65. So a standard uh, in my mind of care is while I used to always prescribe an anti-inflammatory in my early years in practice, uh, I, I pretty much never, mm -hmm. I'm gonna say never, prescribe one to somebody 60 and older mm -hmm. because of the potential risk 
of cardiovascular complications, GI bleeding, and kidney problems. So if you were to get infected with COVID and you are in this higher, higher um, susceptible group that's already been pointed out, it seems to me even more logical that you specifically should avoid non-steroidals because all the organ functions that we're worried about as secondary complications of infection, sepsis, secondary bacterial infection are exactly what we want to avoid that setup. Fabulous information. Thank you. Um, any further comments on that? I agree with George. Uh, yeah. You know, generally we avoid non-steroidals, ibuprofen, naproxen, ketoprofen, there are many, diclofenac in the older folks because of the vascular, the, you know, um, kidney problems, you have a high risk for stomach ulcers and higher blood pressure and then consequent cardiovascular disease. So, and it's interesting, the National Health Service has commented on this. This is the United Kingdom uh, at NHS, and uh, they also responded to some early reports or grumblings about non-steroidals in the COVID-19. And they said, if it's a younger person with arthritis and they're on the non-steroidal, not to stop it, okay? But if they were to get infection, they said, well, why don't you then take acetaminophen, which is Tylenol? So they just give an alternative uh, in case you get, you know, aching and but most of our folks, you know, in the younger age groups who are taking non-steroidals do have inflammation. And if you need it, by all means, with safety in mind, take it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fabulous. Yes, go ahead. I would like to mention that it is important to source the information, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what George was mentioning uh, was originated from a case study from a young person, I think it was in France. And from then they extrapolated that non-steroidals were not good. So you can you have to know where where everything is uh, where the threat originates, because what, one patient doesn't mean much, right? It was unfortunate for this person, but uh, you cannot generalize a case report. Yeah, understood. Thank you. And now let's get into a topic uh, that's uh, very popular amongst our questions here, and that's. Uh, methotrexate. So let's talk about um, people who have been taking, let's say someone's on methotrexate um, and then we'll even get into some of the other disease modifying drugs, but let's start with methotrexate. If you're on methotrexate, does this increase your risk of getting this virus? Jose, you want to take that? Sure. I, uh, I do not think so. Uh, hmm. You're, you're, uh, when you are a, uh, Methotrexate will, will affect your immune system in certain ways, and I think that doesn't necessarily, at least I'm not aware of any information that will increase your risk for a viral infection. Um, I don't know if you guys have read anything about this, but uh, I have not seen any information that will increase your risk. I'm I God. Jose, you know, the way I look at methotrexate is that it, it regulates the immune system. It's immunomodulating and not so much immunosuppression mm -hmm. in the doses that rheumatology uses. And, and I think Clint and I had talked about this um, in our conversation that I think people on methotrexate, they have normal white counts, generally speaking, and they're immunocompetent. Right. So uh, I don't think, as you said, Jose, they're at higher risk. And, and my literature search, I didn't come up with anything either. Yeah. The only caveat I'd like to add to that, and I agree with, with uh, Jose and Nisha on this. I, I don't believe it's immunosuppressive, but there is a subgroup of patients who are more susceptible to methotrexate in terms of toxicity, and they can develop uh, blood abnormalities, white cells, anemia. Uh, low platelets, any of the cell lines in the bone marrow, if they are inherently deficient of folate mm -hmm. for any reason. And then we have to think about uh, these mutations that are common in the general population. They're called SNP mutations. And therefore, they are of the variety of about half the population carries them, some more in certain ethnicities but they're the so-called MTHFR, M as in Mary, T as in yeah. Tom, H as in Harry, yeah. F as in Frank, R as in Robert, the, 
the um, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase sy system is responsible for energy in the cell. So if you have this mutation and you have the whole mutation, meaning you have the whole mutation from your mom and your father, you are therefore homozygous, then um, methotrexate could become a problem uh, for you if you are not taking the right type of folate. Um, and what can happen there is that when you take the methotrexate, uh, your white cells can go down, your red cells can go down, your platelets can go down. So therefore, if your white cells go down enough, then you are more susceptible to infection. That, that aside, uh, I agree with our comments. Okay, great. Again, this then comes back to your comment before and what I said right at the top, Dr. Muniz, about needing to get this specific information from your, from your rheumatologist because um, that, that level of detail is obviously very case-specific. Correct. Right. right. Okay, great. Okay, um, so, so we have a question. Uh, someone has come off their methotrexate uh, because of the uh, fears that they have um, and is asking now that I'm not on my immunocontrolling, uh, modulating medication and I'm on no medication, am I, at, uh, am I in a better situation? Um, well, I think we talked right at the start that, you know, uh, Dr. Munoz, you said that um, common sense or at least intuition applies that generally, you know, if you have an autoimmune disease, whether or not you're on medication or not, you tend to be at an increased risk. So I don't believe we need to go further into that. We're all in agreement with that, even if it's just an intuition that's not obviously confirmed because this disease, this virus only been around a few months and the studies have not been done, correct? Correct. 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 Good. Okay. So moving along to just the other range of disease modifying drugs before we close out with some biologic uh, discussion. Um, oh boy. These, <laughs> the sulfur salazine um, is one that I had on my list. Um, any comments around that being anything out of the ordinary? No? Not really. I mean, it's no. not the same as with other medications. It will not, that there's no information. And, and yeah. my understanding is other countries have looked after, as Misha said, years ago after the SARS, they have looked at different antibiotics. And the only one that shows uh, in vitro and uh, uh, an effect decreasing the replication of the virus has been Plaquenil. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to the biologic drugs. Uh, Dr. Munas, uh, you, you made a little, uh, a little grunt uh, when I mentioned them. People are concerned around their mm -hmm. biologic treatment. Um, you know, it, the questions, I'm just watching questions, by the way. I know that I haven't specifically read out people's names and questions at this point. That's because a bulk of what we're going through now, I, I anticipate, is answering a lot of these questions um, in a sweeping way. So that's what I'm hoping to do. Um, but I'm, what I'm noticing as questions pass up on my screen here, uh, several people are taking different types of biologic drugs, Simsia, Humira, Enbrel, et cetera. Um, can you please uh, pass some commentary around their, their likelihood of risk? So I'm going to start start this by saying once again, it's like the, the, the ultimate disclaimer. Uh, <laughs> please always discuss this with your rheumatologist. Again, uh, there are stylistic differences. There's experiential differences, where one practices, what city you live in, your age, your general health, so many variables. So. I'm going to speak in generalities. Uh, I am of the school, and I know that all the, uh, if we had 10 rheumatologists, we might get 10 different answers on this, okay? I think uh, uh, Dr. Pando, Dr. Manick, and I tend to, in general, be pretty well aligned. But this is one area where we may, may be a little different. Uh, so the biologics um, and what their effect on COVID uh, is, in my view, is as follows. We don't have any data, really, as to the safety or lack of it with COVID specifically. What we have, in my opinion, is some generalities about the autoimmune diseases and what happens with uncontrolled inflammation. If we have a patient that is uncontrolled, their risk of infection is actually higher. 
So therefore, one is weighing the risk of the treatment versus the risk of the disease uncontrolled. And again, that's why this is so important, in my opinion, that each patient be individually assessed by the rheumatologist who knows them, their history, their, their tendencies, their nuances, uh, fears, and psychosocial situations, which will either make it easier or harder for them to adhere to a treatment plan, whether it's avoiding medicine or actually being on full board with medicine. So that, in my opinion, this applies to pretty much all of them. I will say that the B cell depletion drugs for lupus, I think carry a little bit more risk than some of the other rheumatoid type medicines that are not B cell depleters. And, you know, again, uh, I will uh, point out to my case uh, of one of my lupus patient on Benlista, and I'm not bashing Benlista, we have many patients on it, but that is a B cell depleter. And that patient went from very well to very ill in a very short time uh, on Plaquenil. Does that mean that everybody on Benlista is gonna develop uh, pneumonia from COVID? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there probably are some nuances in the biologic mechanisms, but we don't have all the data. And I think that we have to be uh, uh, very astute observers we have to report uh, everything to our physicians, our doctors, our family. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's good to have somebody else in the appointment with you as, as, a, um, um, as a helper. And yes, we're doing a lot of telemedicine and we usually have family members in the visit. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop there, but that's my general uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. Can, be before we have another comment about that, um, would you say, therefore, that C-reactive protein levels are proportional to risk, risk, uh, infection risk? So, um, so one can say that you know we have we have the um, that might be an oversimplification, right? Not CRP mm -hmm. isn't always purely autoimmune. Uh, uh, driven, there can be metabolic issues uh, mm -hmm. that are not primary immune inflammation, but rather other systemic inflammation. That's one. Number two, we have other biomarkers that we use. I'm a believer in using a, a multi biomarker called Vectra uh, because it's got 12 different parameters, of which uh, CRP is one, uh, IL 6 is another. TNF alpha receptor is another, and, and, and there are other markers. So uh, using that in rheumatoid patients seems to have uh, validity as to their disease activity, mm -hmm. um, their prognosis, mm -hmm. and also comorbid uh, situations, for example, inflammation of other organs outside the joint. So that's important. Now, CRP is part of it, but yeah. CRP alone without the other patient reported questions, the outcomes, the metrics that we use uh, are helpful. So there isn't one, one test. You know, I, I think we as clinicians have to take the composite, our mm -hmm. patient, how well we know them, our intuition and our experience and put it all together. Beautiful. Right. Okay, right, before we, before we move on to virus avoidance strategies, um, would uh, uh, Dr. Manik or Dr. Pando like to uh, comment further on uh, on biologics? Well, you know the um, the strategies that have really taken off for research around the world are three pronged. One is antiviral strategies, and and these are the drugs that are used in HIV disease on Ebola. And um, in Wuhan, they had used antiretroviral with not much effect, but they're still being pursued by uh, several, um, you know, clinical groups. The second um, arm is a lot of people, fortunately, the majority of people who get COVID-19, oh, this novel coronavirus infection, actually develop immune uh, the, immunity. They're, 
walking bags of immunoglobulin, if you will. And so these are the folks that now they're separating immunoglobulins as a treatment, as a passive transfer of treatment to people who are really sick. So that's the second arm that has garnered a lot of attention. The third arm is where we as rheumatology community come in, and that is this COVID-19 in some people induces the immune response in such a robust way, as George said, you get a cytokine storm, you get such an overactive immune system. And that's where I think Plaquenil holds it back a little bit. And that's where interleukin-6, which is one of the cytokines implicated in, in this cytokine storm and lung damage. And so you might have read in the reports that Kevzara and Actemra, these are the medications that block the interleukin-6 response. Uh, there are biologics that we, we use a, a lot in rheumatoid arthritis. So what will turn out? Will they be really useful uh, long term? We will see. And I think we'll get data very quickly. Maybe in the two to three weeks from now, we'll get a better picture what's going on with when you use interleukin-6 inhibitors. I know, I know Jose has, uh, you run a trial in your clinic using Kevzara, if I'm not wrong. We did, yes, in the past. Yeah. So, Do you have any more to add on that? So what I know is that the FDA has fast-tracked mm -hmm. IL-6 inhibitors and they're being used in the hospital in the ICU setting for mm -hmm. patients that are having, as you point out, the cytokine storms. Yes. Um, that there's preliminary data that came from China that it was helpful in those cases. Uh, the data in Europe and, and in this country is just evolving. So as, as you said, probably in the next two months, we'll have a, a more robust set of uh, points to interpret, mm -hmm. but at this point, we're not there yet. Yeah. I know that, I, I know that, uh, that the, the FDA has looked and fast-tracked this, and it has given its approval to use in the ICU settings. Right. right. Okay, fabulous. Now, um, Dr. Munoz, you look like you're about to say anything. Um, would you like to comment before I try and wrap up and summarize what I believe I've understood from our discussions around the medications. Yeah, I just remember seeing a little question on Actemra since we kind of veered in that direction. Um, and I just want to point out again that I, I don't think Actemra is a preventative of COVID, nor does it really make it uh, specifically worse. I, you know, it, it's under the general rubric of what we already said. And again, uh, if you have any questions, always ask your rheumatologist um, so as to know individually what you should do. Wow. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you. I'm going to try and summarize now and act on behalf as a, uh, as, as an, a, a participant and see whether or not I've understood these guidelines. Um, and, and then you can comment as to if I've made any uh, misunderstandings. Uh, so first of all, we talked about the steroids, prednisone. We didn't talk about prednisolone, but I think we can categorize those together. Mm -hmm. um, and the general feeling was that over 10 milligram of this medication is perhaps not the best idea to be uh, keeping safe against the virus. Um, and just over 10 milligram on a long-term basis, not a good idea necessarily in any case for other reasons. Um, but under 10 milligram a day, getting down to five and so forth, uh, is not necessarily, well, there's no data to suggest that that is going to increase your risk of infection. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, including ibuprofen um, and the other forms, uh, also no evidence to suggest other than some sort of highly extrapolated ibuprofen information out of someone who was young out of France. Uh, other than that, it's, there's no reason to become terribly alarmed about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs unless you're a person over the age of 60 and it's because of those medications and their uh, contraindications um, with other body parts, not related to rheumatoid arthritis, but these other conditions that those drugs may exacerbate, especially if you were to contract the virus. And so uh, Dr. Munoz pointed out that um, he thought, you know, in his clinic, he doesn't prescribe these um, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs anyway. And so uh, it's a discussion for your rheumatologist as to whether or not, uh, especially if you're over 60, uh, these should be used. 
Um, and then we talked about disease modifying drugs, methotrexate. Um, Dr. Manick talked about how they are immunomodulating, not necessarily immunosuppressive, meaning that we are going to increase our risk of infection. Um, and, and then with regards to sulfasalazine, there's no, for, no data and no reason to expect that it would be more um, uh, making you more risk susceptible. And then earlier in the call, we talked at length about Plaquenil and we came to the conclusion that if, if you don't have an autoimmune disease and haven't been prescribed it, then don't go trying to steal it off someone who takes it. Right? <laughs> um, and then if you are on Plaquenil because of a prescription reason, then um, there's been a couple of incidences um, in Dr. Munoz's uh, clinic where uh, those people have actually uh, contracted COVID and are recovering okay in line with other people um, who, have, uh, who have not been on the medication. And so Plaquenil has some interesting data that we've, uh, that we've seen that suggests that it may be helpful and in fact supplies are running low because people are trying to take it as a recovery drug for COVID, um, but not to go on it if you otherwise have not been prescribed it. And it's not a preventative drug to avoid getting the, the COVID. Finally, we talked about biologics and what we uh, gathered in the biologic discussion is that a controlled inflammatory arthritic condition through biologic drugs is a safer situation to be in than, than uh, coming off the biologic drugs as a mechanism to reduce your risk of infection and then having a uncontrolled high inflammatory state that mm -hmm. shows up a high marker on a vector score, um, which is going to actually make you at more at risk than what you would have been if you were on an, a biologic drug and controlling your symptoms. So that's what I picked up. Have I missed anything or do I need correcting? Not at this point, it's pretty clear, good. <laughs> All right, good. I, I, uh, I did finish year 12. Okay, so now let's move across to virus avoidance strategies. And this is an area where you, uh, the three of you have many strengths. Um, we have some time here to get into this. And I know that everyone who is watching this wants to avoid getting this condition. Dr. Manick, you've got some great guidelines around this. Um, Let's move through this fairly quickly. Just give us the do this, do this, do this, and then we'll take some questions from our, from our audience here too. Right, right. And, you know, and George and uh, Jose, just jump in. But how I see it is that you have in your kitchen right now many, many things you can implement right away to have antiviral effects and immune boosting effects right away. So, you know, um, ginger root. Favorite, I always have that. Drink lemon water, wonderful stuff. Okay, so teas, hot drinks. Mm -hmm. Throw out the junk food. Folks, throw out the junk food. Throw out the soda pop. Forget the sugar. Just those few things, you're already really in a good position, okay? Then we have many, many other botanicals and supplements that really add on to uh, really keep your immune system in tip top shape. And I want George and Jose to say some things on that because I want them to have a chance to speak. Go ahead, Jose. Weigh in on this. So the basics, because probably your, your, your audience client is asking you what the basics, what can they do? Mm -hmm. Well, if they take their sink and vitamin C, that's a good start, starting point, right? Just to to take uh, to to have a combination of zinc and vitamin C. In some cases, adding elderberry. I don't know if uh, if it's widely available here in the states. It is. So adding uh, elderberry is helpful, and um, and and also it's important to keep in mind that vitamin D is helpful as a preventive. But if you unfortunately get sick, you need to stop the medication then. So uh, vitamin, stop. D, vitamin D, you don't take if you have a virus. Okay, so that's a key point. I'd never heard that before. Okay, so um, if your vitamin D is preventative, but if it, if, if that and everything else doesn't stop you from, from getting it, then you got to stop the vitamin D. Yeah, yes. So um, all this information has been shown to be effective in not necessarily coronavirus, but in some other viruses. 
And right. you know, you, we're extrapolating information that we have gathered from other viral diseases and using it and hoping that it will work for coronavirus as well. Right, right. that's important to mention. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so we've got zinc, vitamin C, which I take with uh, the, I take using the um, uh, lipospheric uh, vitamin C. Um, uh, Dr. Manik uh, and I have spoke about that, it seems to be a good way to go. Um, elderberry, uh, vitamin D, uh, have I missed anything that's a no-brainer? Like, go and do this for sure. George? So, you know, I, I, take, um, I take curcumin as my usual. Uh, that's an anti-inflammatory uh, uh, natural botanical that has many properties, um, uh, many upstream properties in, in the nucleosome. Uh, inhibiting uh, inflammation very high up in, in the chain of command, we might say. Mm. Um, I like Boswellia. I take vitamin D. I take omegas. So basically, during COVID, I'm just doing what I always do, which is I take omegas, zinc, curcumin, uh, folate, um, uh, uh, vitamin C. I like an extended release that's buffered for me. Why do I do that one? Because it lasts all day and I don't have to think about taking things multiple times. Mm. Um, what else? Um, I, I'm going to say that besides the botanicals and the things we've mentioned, some of the minerals and, and vitamins, I'm going to say that for me and, and for my patients, um, this COVID time period, the lockdowns, uh, I try to recommend that people get into a routine they're comfortable with mm. and that mimics their life because if you, um, what, what I believe has happened for many people, myself included, is the disruption in the regular pace of the day creates stress. So stress reduction, breathing, meditation, uh, getting back into exercise, uh, getting my routine back into an organized way helps me uh, cope with the constant changing because there's going to be constant changing here. The story is evolving. We are not in control of many things, but we can control how we react to the situation. So I'm going to stop right there. Can I just uh, give a, just, I like that. Have a routine, have a routine. If folks are worried about, you know, the supplements and doses, I, I had written a little um, guide around my book, Bridging Science and Spirit. And, Vitamin D, many people are deficient, and I usually take 10,000 international units for this period of time for the next couple of weeks. That will jumpstart your immune process. I agree with zinc. Take at least 50 milligrams daily. And I would add selenium to that, mm -hmm. 200 micrograms. Vitamin C, I like lipospheric because it's very quickly absorbed mm -hmm. lipospheric means it's encoded with a lipid layer and it's absorbed very fast take a thousand milligrams at least more if you can if you don't feel so well or even stress take a couple more grams it's fine uh curcumin yes and if you're looking for a good uh, turmeric product make sure it's standardized okay it'll say standardized on the label and usually the dose is 750 milligrams up to 2,000 milligrams daily. If you don't get standardized, make sure it's with black pepper because it's absorbed faster. But it has very nice antiviral properties. So, yes, turmeric, yes, 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 absolutely. And then we can talk about all the mind-body, absolutely, yes. And it actually comes down to the fact we now know this that the, auto, uh, the, the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system controls the immune response very powerfully. So sympathetic and the parasympathetic arms actually feed into the immune system. And you, every person has control over the autonomic nervous system output. Just by breathing, you already engage the relaxation response and you actually down, you know, sort of calm down the immune and inflammatory response. So this is very scientific. It's not 
uh, well, what's that going to do? But it actually does. And we need to teach our patients and teach ourselves these very powerful techniques. And I know Jose has a very beautiful, I know, I remember Jose, when you taught us in that conference, the breathing technique, and you could share it with us. So that's something that uh, I learned from Dr. Weil. Um, mm -hmm. He has it, if you want a demonstration, we can do it here. I don't know if you have time, but it's a four, seven, eight breath, which is you take a deep breath and a count of four, you hold it for seven seconds, and then you exhale over eight, right? With that, you achieve two things. You decrease your, your rate of breathing, and that will stimulate a vagus nerve, and as you stimulate the vagus nerve, that will create a back loop into your brain to cool down and create um, a, a better balance of the autonomic nervous system, as Nisha was mentioning before. But in, in this time, as George was mentioning, of high stress, we all can use a little quiet time and a little breathing time to, uh, to calm down. Totally. Um, and as part of you know, my recommendations to my audience for the past seven on years, uh, exercise has been right up there as one of the most crucial factors for not just uh, health and well, mental well-being, uh, but also inflammation reduction. I've found exercise mm -hmm. just outstanding for myself and for my clients. Thousands of people who just exercise as if they're, you know, really working towards a strong physical health, physical body. Um, and, and now's a great opportunity to do that when we have so much more time on our hands and we can exercise at home. There's countless opportunities to watch videos of yoga or, uh, you know, uh, home, home workouts and so forth. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger is posting them on Instagram and he's, you know, in his uh, 70s or something. So we can, we can all take the opportunity to breathe more, which, of course, is going to strengthen our lungs. So even if we were to... Uh, unfortunately, you get the disease. We also then have stronger lungs and become more resistant to its effects, um, but also in a preventative way. So I'm all about the breathing side of things. I think that is fantastic um, and, um, and just the calm as well. So these are great strategies. Um, I, I have, we have been checking off many of the many questions that have been coming up just by going over the strategy that we put together here. Um, Tilly says, thank you so much for answering my question about Actemra. Um, Millie said, speak about drugs like Zeljans. Well, we've done that, Millie. We've covered the biologic drugs, and I hope you've um, gathered uh, the, the response there. We've talked about Humira for Pam. Now, someone's asking about IV levels of vitamin C. Um, I've actually done that myself way before these, uh, the, this pandemic happened. Um, I didn't notice anything with regard to any aspect of my health at all. It was like it didn't even occur. But do um, you think IV levels of vitamin C is, uh, is something that people should, should try or consider? I know that uh, we've been using intravenous vitamins for a long time. Uh, I take care of a large cohort of athletes. Um, our autoimmune patients, uh, some, many of them have fatigue. While fatigue is a multifactorial condition, sometimes intracellular mineral and intracellular vitamin deficiencies uh, do occur. Um, uh, I, I think there's a strong placebo effect. Um, and it's part of uh, utilizing a whole person approach, uh, not the single curative approach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, patients uh, uh, request, some patients request this continuously, and we continuously try to teach them and taper off that and dependency and really be independent in their nutrition uh, normally through the through enjoying good wholesome um, uh, food that's nutritious that has many colors that is uh, um, high in antioxidants and and and, and uh, minerals and and uh, uh, vitamins and supplementing only w when needed basically so I think there's a place for it but it's not something I recommend for everybody all the time okay 
Thank you. I just want to bullet, uh, just go bang, bang, bang through a couple of extra questions here before we wrap up in a few minutes. Uh, low dose naltruxin, uh, uh, comments on that uh, from anyone? LDN. Safe, safe uh, helpful in fatigue, helpful for some people with fibromyalgia. Uh, that's a condition where I'm always looking for an edge uh, yeah. to be able to help somebody, haven't had any untoward events, have used it in autoimmune lupus patients without problems, have no opinion about its specific utility in COVID. Okay, fabulous. Jen says, thanks so much for organizing this. Another person, uh, Kate says, thank you so much uh, for doing this. It's very much appreciated. Um, uh, glutathione. Mm. I take that. I've only been taking that for about six months or so. Again, I can't say, you know, these things are all these micro contributors. So I don't necessarily think there's one thing that just suddenly changes your life when it comes in a bottle from a, from a company. But, um, you know, glutathione, um, I saw one study about this uh, in the published literature, but it was about, you know, rodents. Um, but it showed that after they were... Um, artificially created uh, inflammation states that supplemental glutathione reduced the autoimmunity response and reduced their inflammation. So that was enough for me to think, oh, well, I'm going to give it a go. And um, again, like, how do, you, how do you know whether or not it's doing it much or not? But I just wanted to get any feedback, if, or, if any, from, from one or two of you. Safe. Use uh, prescribed it a lot along with NAC. It's pre yep. it's precursor. Uh, we don't have large controlled trials again. This is the problem. Uh, is it a contraindication to use? I don't believe so. Um, I do think it it, it carries significant ORAC type anti-inflammatory, anti-reductive uh, capability. Um, I've used it in people with, you know, getting ill with the flu. I've not used it in COVID. I'm not saying to use it in COVID. I'm just telling you about my the, my past experience with it. And uh, some people uh, really respond well to it. Intravenously, intramuscularly, um, or sublingually. Fantastic. Okay, I'm now flicking through some more questions. A lot of people are just saying what they're doing, which is great, and communicating with each other. People are giving each other phone numbers to call each other and, and uh, offer like a community kind of feel, uh, which is fantastic. Um, uh, and again, a lot of the questions that I'm seeing here, we have covered in the bulk of our content and they were posted before we answered these questions. Bob says, I just can't tell you how wonderful and helpful this is. So that is uh, really nice feedback. Um, and oh, someone's asked, what about cortisone injections? Does this make you more prone to COVID? Not really. I mean, if, if you need to be, one of the points that we all have made is that you need to remain functional and need to keep on moving. And if a cortisone injection will allow you to function, I need and to keep on going, that will be good. Right. I did, I did manage to catch that answer as my one and a half year old came into the house. My wife's just going to take, take him out there. Can you lock the door, please, honey? Thanks. Okay. Well, we now, we now um, are coming to the end of our discussion here. Um, I just want to uh, say thank you so much to our panelists today. It has been absolutely sensational. We've had no tech issues to my knowledge. We've been able to hear and see everyone clearly and get some really fabulous information. And what I want to say is very reassuring information and information that, um, you know, doesn't make us uh, all think, oh, no, and, and, and it's so much worse with an autoimmune disease. I would say that for the most part, if your, if your symptoms are well controlled via, via a combination of lifestyle and medical treatment, and you're very cautious with all of the public guidelines, mm -hmm. that, that, that it's okay. And that just don't lose more sleep at night because the stress associated with that, you know, only going to be worse for your, for your uh, likelihood of getting the condition. Mm. Right? You're so, right? You're correct. So we get into our, we, we take those supplements and, and we, we get more exercise and we be mindful, we meditate, we keep, keep moving, we keep positive and we see this thing out 
and we get back into our lives the way they were and we continue to be happy and positive. So I just want to say thank you to each of you. Um, Dr. Pando, can you tell us how people can contact you? Uh, so I don't know if you're taking on, you might not even want to sort of uh, <laughs> open, up, open up to new clients, um, but we've got well over 400 people here uh, and this replay is going to go out to a whole many more thousands. Um, so before we go any further with this, let me re rephrase this. Um, would anyone like to share their contact details? Yeah, um, let, me, let me give you my website, which is okay. DelawareArthritis.com, and they can reach us through there, DelawareArthritis.com. DelawareArthritis.com? That's correct. Okay, and once again, which area do you mostly serve? Uh, I, I live in Delaware, so yep. we see patients from a mid-Atlantic area. Just, okay, all right. But yeah, but you would you take patients from further afield? Yeah, if, if uh, well, we're open to, to, now with telemedicine, we're open yeah. to all possibilities. Open to possibilities. Okay, great. Dr. Munoz? Yes, uh, so I'm just putting it in the chat. I'm in okay. Miami. Um, we are in the uh, 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 greater Miami uh, area. I've got a... A uh, hybrid practice that is uh, rheumatology and integrative medicine. So I'm going to give you the contact for the integrative medicine uh, practice, which is more uh, accessible, I think, and that is uh, theoasisinstitute.com. Theoasisinstitute.com. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yes, if you could pop that into the chat bar, and Dr. Pando, if you could do the same and use the chat bar, which is the third icon from the top, and just also put your details in there, that'd be great. Uh, Dr. Manick, uh, and tell well, us. <laughs> well, Clint, you know, I find myself in a rather unusual position. I'm in Santa Cruz, California, and I came here to set up the practice, and the shelter in place came, and uh, I was due to start practicing in brick and mortar, uh, next month. So that has now been pushed out. So I would just tell the viewers, stay tuned. Just look up Nisha Manik. Uh, in the meantime, I have a new book, Bridging Science and Spirit. So some of my energies go into really forming the program, that routine that serves us in the long term, doing all levels, the physical, the mental, the energetic, and spiritual. You know, today, Wall Street Journal said something I really enjoyed. Pray up a storm, prayer works. So with, you know, and it controls the autonomic nervous system. But coming back to my details, I hope to have a physical practice. I do do telemedicine for patients who are underserved in the upper Midwest, South Dakota and Minnesota, uh, where most of my patients are. So I do do some clinical medicine through the telemedicine portal. And it's a system that I'm, I'm actually employed to. Um, I will be looking at telemedicine on my own uh, out of California, and that I'm, I'm exploring some some options here. So stay tuned, and I'll let you know, Clint, and you can put it on your site. So thank you for that. I think that's that's a really good uh, suggestion. Why don't um, I have our specialists here all uh, just also email their um, their uh, contact information to me, and if anyone's unsure. Just uh, email info at pattersonprogram.com and I'll be able to have a canned response reply and we can just have my staff just click that and it goes out and then you'll get the contact details of each of our special guests today. Let's just close off with some comments before I say final thank yous. Uh, so uh, Guinea says, uh, and I'm terrible at Spanish, muchas gracias a todos. Thank you to everybody. That's what it means. <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you to everybody. Um, Diane says, thank you very much. I echo that it has been very helpful. And she says, hello to my kiddos and Melissa. Melissa's my wife uh, that came in. Um, listen to this one. Teresa says, first time I have felt calm since this started. And the child, oh. yeah. Okay, so like that has, you can see how much benefit that has provided. First time she's felt calm since this started. And the child in me smiles. Thank you. Um, okay, and then we've had uh, agree. This was very helpful in capital letters. Thank you, Clint, and all. Um, hi to the little one. Hi. Um, what a gift this webinar has been. Thank you so much. Um, and then Joy, uh, Joy has another question. I think we're out of time for questions. It's regarding L, the supplement, um, L-lysine, which is an amino acid, isn't it? 
Um, I, I don't know if uh, uh, that amino acids either here or there in terms of COVID, we would have no data on that. Um, and then uh, Donna says, thank you. What a gift this webinar has been, says Evelyn. And I think that that uh, will take us right through. Uh, Sherry says, thank you, Stacey, thank you so much. Uh, Kelly, many thanks to you all. Jill says, heartfelt thanks to you all. So, uh, and Therese says, thank you all so much. It's been wonderful resources, very reassuring. So you can see that the, the, uh, the comments are really supporting. Uh, are supportive and I'm, 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 I want to echo everyone's remarks and just say uh, on behalf of our audience today um, and the rheumato rheumatoid community and the autoimmune community, thank you so much to our guests. So I'd really like to uh, extend uh, much gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you and muchas gracias back. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pando. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Munoz. And thank you, Dr. Manek. I'm going to close out now. Uh, my panelists, I'd like you to just stay on the line uh, and I'm just going to close off. We're going to go off here. All the best. Stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Very pleased to be able to bring this to you and uh, just stay safe. Keep exercising. Keep doing the right things. And, um, and I'll talk to, you another, talk to you another time.